Chandru Wadwani, Joint Managing Director, Extrupit, talking about chasing our tails. The door's locked? Okay. Afternoon. Um, afternoon to the Honorable DDG and team members. Uh, the waste pickers, I'm not sure who's in the room today. Is it Aro? Uh, but without you, there is no recycling in South Africa. Uh, Nico, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Hert and the whole team at Safford Paul, uh, thank you. It's, it's a little surreal um, being asked to talk as a successful recycler because uh, ordinarily those two words never make it into the same sentence. I think it's been, uh, recycler has been more synonymous with uh, failure. But what I'd hope to do today is uh, share with you what has been the experience um, of how sometimes it can really feel that we're chasing our tails. And that's got a lot of connotation to it. And I'm going to let you come to your own conclusions uh, by the end of it. So for me, uh, it's the final part of this. It's not as I watched the dog chasing his tail, I thought dogs are easily amused. It's that I realized I was watching the dog chase his tail. And I think many a time um, when I've made presentations in the past, actually a lot of the slides I've used today are probably in some instances over 10 years old. So it does feel like sometimes uh, not only are we having the same conversations, but we seem to enjoy uh, watching our four-legged loved ones uh, chase their tails. And the narrative today, it's, I mean, you, you don't see any discussion today, especially on the negative sentiments towards single-use plastics, that doesn't hinge around that 9% number. Everything is about the 9% that's recycled, or the clever way of they're now portraying it is that a whopping 91%. And I think Anna B alluded to this in her presentation, is as much as we celebrate growing recycling, if we're not mindful of one, what we're not collecting, that that tends to shape uh, the narrative at the end of the day. And it's getting a little loud out there, if we haven't noticed. Uh, it's become an incredibly emotive subject. And in some instances, as I'll elaborate on, I think rightfully so. So this is the narrative. Um, this was last week. Um, more than 170 trillion plastic particles afloat in the ocean. To give it a bit of context, not five years ago, it was just five. I sometimes wonder how they do these calculations that we've suddenly gone from five trillion up to 170 trillion. But you can see how the narrative starts to form around the case against plastics. Up to 40% of plastic litter dumped on land enters the ocean every year. I think the other one that I recall is this thing by 2050, we'll have more plastic than fish in the sea. What's interesting, and I don't think a lot of people know, is that actually was retracted. I think it was Yellen MacArthur who put it out and were found that the science around that calculation might have not been entirely accurate. And it's not new. Um, already back in 2017, the UN declares war on ocean plastics. And as we heard Helen talk about, this discussion now about the UN treaty to end plastic pollution, I think brings with it a lot of challenges that if we don't address it in a contextual manner of what is the role of products like plastics, and sometimes we actually end up causing more harm um, than good. Equally, uh, reports call for boosting plastics recycling to 70%. So I think the debate and the need for recycling, is, it's kind of moved on. We really shouldn't be having that anymore. And the area of focus for me really is on the facets of what drives it. This also came out last week, you know. So the response is actually a little bit obvious. Uh, Mr. Sparrow, bless him talked about a study showing that PET plastic bottles create less solid waste, use less water during production, and generate fewer emissions. What the telling part is what he went on to say, is that I highly doubt a new LCA showing that plastic bottles are less harmful to the environment than cans and bottles 
will change any minds in our tribal culture, but it is our duty to report. So given the noise out there, how do we ensure that we have a platform where we can have these discussions with all stakeholders, including government, uh, including brand owners, including manufacturers as well? And the circular economy is actually, I think, getting a lot more uh, prominence, um, but a lot of confusion still if Hanabi's graphics were anything to go by. Not the easiest concept for most people to understand. But what I'd like to focus on is, I don't know how I do this, the thing about design out waste and pollution. And it's nothing new. Uh, I don't know how many know about this. This thing is 30 years old. The EU Ecolabel identifies products and services that have a reduced environmental impact throughout their life cycle. As far back as 2006, RAP talked about 86% of respondents felt it would be good if packaging contained recycled plastics. Back in 2009, pre-cycling is a new buzzword that refers to the act of knowingly buying a product that can be easily disassembled or recycled at the end of its life. So really the area of focus for me today is around this thing about design for recycling. The other key pillar on which recycling sits is the premise of collect and do what, but I think we heard from one of the earlier speakers that in the absence of demand, it actually doesn't matter how you design it, it's still end up destined to end up in the uh, landfills. And this is standard. Strange choice of uh, acronym there. I don't know if BS is the right word to use, but many a time when we get calls as recycler, well, how do we do it? Is it possible? Well, already back in 2017, there is a standard, you can download it, that talks you through the process of how to look at any product, not just plastics, in terms of its design with a view to its end of life. Sets out two things, uh, in essence, what the circular economy is and why moving towards it might be beneficial as well as how to implement the principles of the circular economy. So as much as a confusing subject area it is, it's wonderful to see that there is work out there, that if our intentions are true, we can actually follow laid down standard systems that we partly talked about earlier. And we now see it in, in our legislation. This, this is part of the Waste Act. And really what I want to focus on is this thing at the bottom about rethinking product design. And it isn't just a threat. I think there's opportunity as well. Um, the fact that using a higher content of recycled material is actually key in terms of answering some of these pressures coming from governments today, which I think we've heard are not only here to stay, but probably will end up with a larger footprint uh, across the world. So designed to increase recyclability. Um, this picture is probably 10 years old. Um, thankfully, these bottles don't exist in the market anymore. Uh, opaque PET is a huge problem for recycler. Uh, this brand owner subsequently made the change. Um, and what used to be an opaque bottle is now a clear bottle. Uh, we're still working on the green bottle. Uh, hopefully that will phase out. But even after all the work we've done, and this is why sometimes it feels like we're chasing our tails, or let me just talk about color anymore, uh, firstly, uh, we're starting to see that there are brand owners ready to make the right choices. So this is Coca-Cola's move on taking the green out of Sprite. Um, obviously, it's good to be clear, but for my friends from Big Red in the room, Mr. Lionel, there's a few more bottles out there in your stable. Uh, that we look forward and maybe you'll make an announcement too. So things like putting color into your product has a huge impact in terms of where it's going to end up at end of life. But sadly, opaque is back. Just when we thought we had got the message out there to the greater industry, we're seeing a big push, especially from the dairy industry, 
who for some reason have decided it's better to move out of a perfectly recyclable HDPE bottle, worth its weight in gold these days, I'll have you know, and have gone into a product that's so difficult to recycle, it can't even be downcycled. These products are designed to fail. And I think when we as an industry are part of a process that allowed these kind of products to end up on our shelves, you can sometimes appreciate why the narrative against single-use plastics is so triggering for so many people. If anyone has any influence or input with the dairy industry and some of the cosmetic guys, so it's not just dairy, please spread the message. If you're going opaque on PET, your bottle is destined for the landfill and for the oceans. Other problem, all of a sudden, metal closures. We've seen a transition of the predominantly the alcohol industry, I think moving out of glass, uh, going into uh, PET bottles, sometimes with some really challenging colors, but using a metal closure. Again, designed to fail. Is that PET bottle technically recyclable? Yes. Is it going to be recycled? No. Collectors know today that this product has no value. So in essence, it's just never going to get picked up in the first instance. So how we design, again, lends to that bigger debate about how uh, we're going to solve some of these challenges. And it's, it's nothing new. I mean, this story is over 20 years old. It's not that the world doesn't know. This was Nestle back in 2001, realizing that the aluminum cap on uh, their Perrier bottle was causing huge challenges. So I think sometimes we've got to ask ourselves, and I really appreciate Safripol putting these kind of forums together, is how do we as a collective ensure that A, this doesn't happen, and B, that we're not part of the process? I must say I do feel for the converters sometimes, because I, I know in many instances where they fought the good fight to try and explain to their customers these design ethics that will influence end of life for their products. But the pushback from brand owners, uh, this whole thing about shelf space awareness or differentiation uh, from my uh, competitor's product, uh, the reality is, if you don't get this right, like I said, your, your bottle is heading uh, straight to the landfill. And it's not that it can't be done. So this is a vodka bottle. Sweden made the transition from glass to PET, but if you have a close look at that closure on top, I think it's a bit difficult to see, but it's actually a polyolefin closure, which is ideal for PET recycling. Hopefully they haven't printed on the bottle, but I'll give them the benefit of the doubt that that's a label. And the other one, uh, which was shrink sleeve labels. Uh, historically, Shrink sleeve in South Africa has been made from either PET or PVC. Not only are PET and PVC shrink sleeve labels not recyclable in their own right, even if you can take them off, and you'll see some brand owners put this perforation in there, but it means the bottle's not going to get collected as well. There are solutions. One was this example. Uh, Ribena is part of the Lucozade brand. I think it's owned by Suntory in Japan. In the absence of having a solution for the label, they just went ahead and redesigned the whole bottle. So sometimes to look at products, you know, in a multi-dimensional manner to try and solve what is its end of life uh, challenges is, is the path to take. The good news though, because as recyclers we're forever complaining and moaning and, you know, we don't understand the plight for brand owners um, who are fighting for market share. The good news is, with three label suppliers, we have trialed and tested floatable shrink sleeve uh, for the South African market. So I think we also identify that sometimes we have to be part of the solution. The challenge, though, will be on the uptake, because it's early days, it's in its infancy. There is possibly a little cost upcharge in the beginning, but our feeling is, as this becomes more widely adopted, 
there is very little excuse for any brand owner to be using a PET or PVC shrink sleeve label on a PET bottle. And thanks to Petco for assisting uh, out with that as well. Uh, the good news is there are solutions. And I think in some times, we're actually setting the benchmark for um, the international market. And if we're not careful, then this is what we end up with. I, I can't even begin to understand how a bottle can simultaneously be biodegradable, recyclable, reusable, and made from recycled materials. Forget that it's opaque and destined for the landfill or those cute dolphins of our coastline. Um, this is a classic example of how it's one step forward and a hundred steps backwards. Uh, I hope this hasn't entered our market. We have seen, sadly, some bottles now made from PLA, um, biodegradable, compostable. That's a real challenge for the PET recycling. Not to mention, I believe they're charging three times the cost. How is that sustainable in its own right? And the other one that we have to be mindful of, you know, this wonderful what I think is sometimes referred to as pilot washing. Let's go harvest some bottles from the middle of the Pacific um, and go make uh, running shoes from it. I think the running shoes cost $300 a pair. Uh, how is that sustainable? And when you pose the question, well, okay, of your whole portfolio of millions of shoes, how many are actually made from recycled plastics? And there's usually silence. And I think that, again, feeds into that negative rhetoric and reputation that plastics can sometimes invite upon itself. The elephant in the room, though, and I'm never welcome when I bring up this subject, is the issue of light weighting. I think a lot of the narrative from resin producers, chemical companies, brand owners, is we appreciate the challenge of plastics in our waste stream. And I think the minister wasn't far off the correct number, 400 million tons per annum. And if we're not there next year, I'm sure we'll be there very soon. One of the things is, well, we're going to use less virgin plastic to make it. What's the challenge from a waste management standpoint? Is pickers, not unique to South Africa, do not pick up products that don't have value. And the lighter you go, the less is the value of that product. I think it's well understood that why is it plastic bags that are 9 out of 10 times targeted to be banned? It's not because they're not recyclable. They're wonderfully recyclable. It's just that they're too light to have any commercial value to pick up. So one of the most difficult conversations that I find I have with brand owners today is be mindful of light weighting. You're going to save a little money on your virgin cost, but I'm convinced, given the move, whether it's from government or from consumers, is it's probably going to end up costing a lot more to the industry in general. And a very important aspect um, is, as much as we used to talk about design for recycling, what we really need is to design for purpose. And just by way of a loose example, don't worry about the accuracy of this. This was a study done on the cost breakup of a 29 euro t-shirt sold in Europe. The labor cost was a measly 18 euro cents against that $29. So I think, and I don't think it's unique to South Africa, when we look at the value chain of waste and recycling, the issue of uplifting the waste pickers and making sure that their role in this economy changes is critical. I don't think we're going to progress the issue on plastic pollution if we're not also mindful of the whole value chain of how it's going to work. I want to be very open and upfront. As a recycler, I would love for there to be separation at source tomorrow. The reality of separation at source is it's incredibly expensive to fund. And when you live in a part of the world where you have issues around healthcare, housing, and education, the reality is you're very unlikely to have it. 
So if recycling is going to grow on the continent in other parts of the world, it's on the back of the waste pickers. And how they are included in this process for me will be critical as well. The reality is that virgin plastic consumption, whether we like it or not, with all the light weighting, with all the recycling, I think is still forecast to grow. It's not coming down. And what's the big driver? Is obviously populations are increasing. And it's increasing fastest on the African continent. So ultimately, I think we've got to be mindful that we are the choices that we make today. How we design plastic packaging and other products for that matter. I think in the context of what is total waste in South Africa, Charles, help me out. Plastics is one and a half percent of the total waste we generate in this country. Um, it's, it's very easy to fall into this negative loop about how bad plastics is. Put it in context and you start seeing it differently. However, if we're going to put out opaque PET or metal closures or the other examples on poorly designed packaging, then I think we almost deserve the negativity that comes around single-use plastic. So make wise choices, please. And that's the narrative that I alluded to at the beginning. Are we going to chase our tail and forever talk about this only 9% is recycled? Or can we start celebrating what are the actual achievements of South Africa? Petco's audited numbers, Shiri, soon to be re-audited. That'll keep you up a few nights. Um, 90,000 tons, 63%. I think that's an extraordinary recovery rate and a wonderful success story. But this is because on the whole, the majority, and as much as I've highlighted the problematic bad faith actors in the industry, the bulk of PET bottles are actually incredibly well designed for recycling. But how do you change the narrative so that we're not having the same discussions every time we come together? And ultimately, this is what stays with me. If we don't think with our, about our future, we cannot have one. One of the reasons that sometimes we fall behind on recycling is because the lead time to set up recycling infrastructure, especially on bottle to bottle today, you're pro probably talking a minimum of two years. If we don't start building that into our plans of the future, and the fact that consumption is increasing sometimes faster than we're collecting, the reality is we'll be having the same discussion next year and the year after and the year after. We've got to become far more proactive and understanding of how these industries work at a recycler level. And I think uh, Walter will hopefully allude to this as well when he speaks. Um, ambition is great. Challenges on the ground work a little differently. There's a frenzy of uh, appetite for recycling plants in Europe now because their legislation kicks in from 2025. What used to be a seven-month lead time, and my friend from Erema can allude to this, is now probably closer to two years. So you don't just put up a recycling plant tomorrow. It just doesn't work like that anymore because the whole world has the same challenge. Thank you. Thank you.